Hey guys, thanks for joining. Um, this could be a little different. This is not going to be a Q and A recording that you're typically seeing. This is going to be more just an informal discussion talking about a certain data science topic. Um, I recently posted an article on how do you build a study guide for interviews, which was really well received. So I thought, why not break down other facets of the interview process, whether it's um, more prep materials or how do you actually react to certain questions you get in your interview itself. Um, so today we're going to really focus on how do you detail and describe a project when an interview asks about it. I think 100% of all the interviews I've been, I've had an interview say, hey, this is an interesting project. Can you just walk me through end to end what you did there, right? And I think it's really important to have a clear and concise and organized structure for how you describe that so that they get all the information that they need and you're not kind of running off and spending time on topics that really aren't that um, important. Now I do have a structure and process and if you've already read the blog post that I put out, you could skip towards kind of when I actually get into the example, which I'll put the timestamp below. But if you haven't, definitely like stay along and I'll actually walk through the six steps that I take to make sure I'm covering every key point um, within kind of my, my process here. Um, so first, I think the most obvious is the problem statement. I think it's important to clearly lay out what you worked on and why you worked on it. I think why is really important, right? Was there, like, what's the impact? What's the scale of the problem at hand? Um, next is team size and your role in the team. And this is one that people really forget about all the time. I think you really want to highlight, this was a team of marketing folks and data engineers. This was a team onshore, offshore. Show that you've had to work with a large scale team that requires clear communication on your part, right? Also, did you work on just one function or did you build the entire code, code end to end? They're gonna to wanna to know like how involved were you, right? Was your role maybe less more like um, interfacing with stakeholders versus technical or was it both? It's really important to touch them on that so they understand kind of your impact in a certain project. Um, then solution process. I think this is where you start getting to the nitty gritty and really talk about the technical details. Um, talking about things like how you handy, handle multicollinearity, right? How, did, what kind of features did you create? Like, were you really um, creative in the features that you created, right? Um, anything along the lines of like, how did you tune the model, et cetera, right? Like all of the things are really important to answer in this section. It really shows like what technical solutions to use, right? And I'll keep even more examples, right? Did you use EMR uh, to write all the code? Was it distributed using PySpark? Like this goes on and on, but pick a handful that you think are the most impressive in terms of your solution process and run with that. Um, if they're more curious about other things, they'll ask, but at least have a handful that you can kind of like, like just speak about at that moment. Um, next is also similar solution, but I'd like to break it off is the model development and model tuning. Um, this deserves its own section because there's so much in there and it requires kind of that level of detail. Um, so this is what was your baseline model, right? How did you tune your model? How did you tune the hyperparameters, hyper right? Um, why did you select a certain model, right? Um, how did you optimize? What was your evaluation me metric? Like, how did you actually use that to optimize, right? These things are really important because model tuning is everything in a machine learning or data science job. It's really important. So if you can easily show that you have kind of the thought process and the mindset to logically go about building and tuning a model, it's really impressive to an interviewer. Then the fifth step is kind of wrapping it all up is how did you deliver it, right? And this could be anything from saying you built a website to showcase the model, you wrote a Medium article, um, you had to present in front of really influential stakeholders, or it was then embedded into an app that's used by um, farm reps, or that's my example, but farm reps or anyone else, right? Just highlight that you, it's like end to end, right? You were thinking from a holistic perspective that it's not just writing code. I actually want to take this code and present it in a meaningful way. Um, this showcases your communication skills, showcases that you are thinking like that way that you want to kind of wrap it all up, which is really important, right? Highlighting your communication skills is really critical. Um, like I said, does it matter if it was in front of a VP or just a blog post? It's still important to showcase um, how you, um, uh, how you display that model. Um, and then the last is next step. And this, you may or may not have this section, right? But I think it's really good, especially if it's like a really huge, massive project to showcase. Yeah, we're happy with the results. Things look really great. But 
here are some next steps that we're thinking in terms of model improvement, right? This is kind of a fun section because if maybe there's a lot of holes in your approach that you know they might ask about, if you leave them in this next step section, you show that you've thought about the holes and you know that you want to address them later on. It kind of saves you from, I'm not going to say embarrassment, but it saves you from kind of looking a little clueless when they probe and ask you about these holes that you've kind of laid out. But yeah, those are the six that I think if you highlight them, at least touch upon each of them, you're definitely covering your basis in terms of uh, everything that happened in the project. Um, I like to spend like five-ish minutes, right? Because your interview is probably like an hour, right? So five-ish minutes is really good. Maybe less than that, but um, in my example, I think I'm around the five-ish five -ish minute mark, but you could obviously consolidate that if need be. Um, so I think that's a good segue. I think I'm gonna share my screen. We're gonna kind of hop into my resume and then I'll show you an exact example. And like I said, I'm gonna pretend like you guys are the interviewer and um, kind of show you how I would go about presenting a, um, a project. All right, cool. So here you see kind of a specific example I'm gonna run you through. And this is actually what you see on my resume, the screenshot up here. Um, it's an NLP project I've worked on for a client. Uh, below that, you see this project kind of broken out into the six components that I mentioned earlier. Um, I'm going to walk through those uh, piece by piece, and then at the very end, kind of pretend like we're in an interview and you guys are the interviewer, and I'll run through it as if kind of I'm actually um, in an interview. Um, so I'll quickly go through these, and then we'll run through the actual example. So problem statement, there was a highly like arduous process that required a lot of reading text. So leveraging NLP, we look to automate that process to save a bunch of time for our uh, clients. Um, team structure, it was a pretty large team, 15 people onshore and offshore. Data science team in particular was about five data scientists and I was the lead. Um, solution process at a very high level, I had to vectorize text using TF-IDF and figured out which text was very similar based off of using cosine similarity. Um, model dev and tuning. So one of, there's many different clustering techniques you could use. I use silhouette score in this case to optimize what cosine similarity threshold I should use to dictate which text is similar, which non conformance is similar, and which ones aren't, right? That was kind of the optimization piece in this problem statement. Um, conclusion, now in production, it's being used by over 500 uh, subject matter experts, saving $1.5 million a year. Um, I think what I'm going to go through, I'm going to emphasize per year because this is ongoing basis, just perpetual gains that this uh, product is providing. And then from a presentation perspective, it was presented to SVPs with me presenting kind of most of the data science components of uh, this project. And then next steps, there isn't much to talk about here, but we have discussed uh, incorporating an anomaly detection piece that alerts this entire team when there are risky scenarios that are kind of, like I mentioned, anomalous, right? So not only is it a dashboard that they can analyze, but actually tells them when they should be analyzing, right? It's the next step or the next derivative of what we built so far. So like I said, I'm gonna kind of go through that pretty briefly, but now I'll actually walk through it all again, um, end to end, pretending like you guys have asked me, hey, this is an interesting NLP project. Can you kind of walk me through it, right? I'm gonna kind of run through it exactly as I would in an interview. And I want you guys to notice, it's not gonna be perfect, right? There's gonna be st some times where I might stumble, which is okay, but really what I wanna focus on is really touching upon these six points so that they see, wow, holistically, this was a really complete project. He got to do a lot of different things, had a lot of impact throughout, and that's the most important thing. Um, yeah, so like I said, without further ado, let's kind of hop into it. I'll pretend that you guys asked me, Hey, here's a NLP project that we thought was interesting. Can you tell me more about it? Oh yeah, it's a great question and really interesting project that we worked on with the client of ours when I was consulting. Um, it's really unique in the pharma domain, but the problem statement revolves around these things called non-conformances. And by definition, it's something that didn't go correctly in a manufacturing process. These are all recorded in a tweet-like database. So it's a bunch of tweets this, that describe um, the issue at hand. Um, what people did prior to us getting involved is they would spend hours and hours, even days, compiling all this text and actually categorizing them all together, figuring out which ones are clusters, which aren't, right? And we came in to say, 
all of this can be automated and save you and your team a ton of bandwidth and a ton of time uh, in the long run, right? And that was such a good problem statement, what we set out to do and prove, can we cluster using kind of data science method at the same level as, um, as how the subject matter experts were doing uh, in the project? So the structure of the team was pretty unique where we had both onshore and offshore members, um, 15 in total. The data science team was five in total with me being the overall data science lead. Uh, so that meant really architecting and designing the solution um, from the ground up, creating modules that can be developed by say junior data scientists. Because we did have two junior data scientists on the team who was helping groom, but also making sure they had a meaty portion of the project. That's why when I designed, I made it very modular. Um, yeah, that was essentially a team of, with the uh, kind of our internal team. And obviously we had clients, subject matter experts that were collaborating with regularly because we needed to get some input from them. Solution process. So with text, you could go many different directions. You can go using universal sentence embeddings and Elmo, BERT, maybe some more modern transformers, or you can go very simple and go say TFID after vectorize. There's many different options when we kind of approach this problem. And what we realized is, and we're talking to the subject matter expert, all of the text is pretty homogenous in the way it's written. There's a strict process that says you're supposed to use the same verbiage um, from non-conformance to non-conformance. When we realized that, we realized a semantic portion really isn't that as important. It's more important just to vectorize the text and get that in a really quick, quick like quick and vectorized format. So. TFIDF was a great solution there because like I said, it's homogenous text and that's where TFIDF really excels. So using TFIDF and using um, cosine similarity to figure out which non-conformances were like similar, we found that a threshold of over 0.6 in similarity really kind of really captures uh, any cohort that needs to be analyzed further. How do we get to 0.6? Why do we use cosine similarity? This was interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, cosine similarity is very finite, right? If it doesn't exceed 0.6, it doesn't belong to any cluster, right? And that could just be quote unquote noise or just non-conformances that we don't need to analyze. That's really critical and why this helped out really, like, really well. Um, with things like k-means and things like uh, LDA, we found that it was adding a little too, no too much noise in the clusters that we're outputting, which is something they didn't want. I think a high silhouette score, which is what we use to optimize, it's really critical to them. And that's why using cosine salinity allowed us to really hone in and refine the amount of uh, uh, optimized silhouette score for kind of our output. And like I mentioned, we use silhouette score to figure out, okay, what's the highest threshold we can use for a cosine similarity while keeping a relatively high silhouette score. So that's where the kind of optimization piece came into play. Obviously very iterative process working with the clients, but at the very end, we realized cosine similarity was the best bet. And uh, cosine similarity 0.6 was kind of giving us the most optimal results. Then kind of the conclusion. So what was cool is not only do we have to present it and require that component, but this is now used, it's now used in production by over 500 subject matter experts. And like I mentioned earlier, the cost savings and the time savings actually amount to be calculated amounted to over 1.5 million per year. Um, I wanna emphasize the per year because it's just perpetual gains that they could then invest elsewhere in the organization. Um, from a presentation perspective, we had to present to SVPs and really from the ground up in their organization showing kind of how this is gonna impact their whole organization. Um, I think this project was holistically really kind of fun because end to end from a POC to a production product was a lot of fun and moving forward, we are thinking, let's now track some of these clusters or non-conformance clusters over time to figure out are some of these anomalous, right? And that becomes interesting because then we can start alerting them when they need to really put a lot of focus in, um, in a specific cluster, right? Because now it's more engaging, it's more interacting with the dashboard versus them having to go in and analyze. Um, that's what we're thinking in next steps in terms of next steps, but that's essentially the, prop, uh, the project um, end to end. Uh, I welcome any questions. So that's pretty much it. I think that's kind of how I would present it. I think that was about four to five minutes, which 
if you're running through one project, that's enough. If I realize, okay, it's a 30 minute, like 30 minute interview, maybe I need to cut this back a bit. I would probably like maybe trim down some of these sections, but um, I hope that shows you that how to take this format, this broken apart par portion of my resume into what I would present to them in, in an interview. Yeah, so that's the one example I want to show you. I think it was, this is different than I had seen online. It's something I just want to show you end to end. Just, I want to show you how I would do it, right? And I want to show you that even someone like me, it's not perfect, right? But it does capture the key elements that they're going to want to see and kind of, kind of builds that kind of trust in an interview, right? For lack of a better word. Um, so with that, I think definitely let me know what you think. I think this is definitely new. First time I'm kind of putting this type of video out, right? Drop a comment, let me know, LinkedIn, et cetera. Like, let me know what you thought. If you want more of this type of content, if you want me to bring uh, someone else or maybe some another experienced data scientist or even someone who's looking to break in another junior data scientist, right? And kind of help them and coach them along the way, let me know, right? I'm, all ears and I really want to see kind of what you guys think and where I should take this moving forward. Um, with that, thanks a lot. I'll see you guys in the next video.